So, uh, so what do you? What's your goal for your clinic going forward? What 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 do you hope to? What do you hope to see Prime Health become in the next year, two years, five years? Um, we want to obviously expand with what we do to allow you know for other people. We want to expand how you know the data we gather uh, to be you know much more efficient, much more all encompassing, and kind of incorporate some of these you know specific DNA assays and stuff, but trying to meld through what works, what doesn't, what's yeah. appropriate, what's good and what's not, like but, we were talking about before. I think this is one of the real challenges is there's so many different tests you can do. How do you figure out, you yeah. know, which are the right tests, which are informative, which are actionable? Mm -hmm. um, that can be, that's a real challenge. I mean, this yeah. is sort of what we're also figuring out as part of our Trailblazer program. We're trying a lot yeah. and then asking what gives information that we think is informative and actionable. And genetics is an interesting one, right? Because we've gotten to the point now where genome sequencing is really pretty cheap. Mm -hmm. Anybody can get their genome sequenced. Mm -hmm. um, and so then, but what do you do with that information? Um, and there's only a relatively small number of genes where we have variants that are what I would call, you know, large effect sizes, right? Like the, the BRCA1 gene for breast cancer or APOE for dementia and mm -hmm. heart disease. And then there's a bunch of what we call these polygenic uh, risk analyses that can be done where you have many, many genes that all contribute to one trait. And those, I think, are a little bit harder because we don't really know, uh, in, in many cases, you know, how informative that is for a person's actual risk when you get these polygenic risk scores. And of course, you know, every trait is going to be a combination of genetics and environment. And mm -hmm. under environment, that includes diet and... Mm -hmm you know, all of the lifestyle stuff, in addition to air quality, water quality, all, all of that falls under environment. So it's different for different things. And, and I think we're still figuring it out, you know, in, in house at OptiSpan, um, how do we use that information? How do we tie that into the blood-based biomarkers, the DEXA, you know, ultrasound, cancer screening, um, and integrate that in a way that's actually useful. And biological age tests. We haven't really talked about biological age, but mm -hmm. you know that's an emerging area where we have tools today that weren't available five years ago that supposedly can measure biological age. How do you integrate that into your you know health span practice? Mm -hmm. Clearly, it's important, but I don't know if these tests are actually to the point where we can use them in an actionable way. Yeah. You guys do biological well, age testing? No, well, we're we've added it in. Yeah, we don't do it on everybody, but anybody who wants it, we get it done. Yeah, so we don't we don't do it as a rule. That's the epigenetic yeah. tests. Yeah, yeah. So, so it's like yeah, and what'll be nice is as we make changes moving forward, rechecking them and seeing if we're able to you know change some of those things. Right. Right. Like you said, move the needle. Yeah. 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 And again, I think that's where the biological age tests are to be determined, right? Yeah. How responsive are they mm -hmm. um, to lifestyle changes? But I think also then how do you how do you actually validate that? So let's say you've got somebody who I mean, this is actually an interesting question, right? How would you interpret somebody? We'll go back to Dave, right? So Dave, Dave takes the epigenetic test. And then six months later, he takes another epigenetic test. And, you know, according to the test, he's biologically 10 years younger, but none of his other biomarkers have moved. How do you interpret that? Uh, I would put the weight more on the biomarkers initially. Yeah. Um, with that, if with him being 10 years younger on the biological age, I would scratch my head and not really <laughs> yeah. put much weight on that. Me too. I would agree with you. And I, that's a that's just a that's a hypothetical, yeah. right? I don't I don't even I mean this is part of the problem we don't really know with these tests yet. How often does that happen? Yeah. Right? So but I I would agree with you. I think for now I much more weigh the well-established mm -hmm. clinical biomarkers, blood chemistry, body composition, things like that compared to these more, you know, theoretical biological age metrics. Yeah. If somebody's prediabetes is getting worse, I don't, you know, that trumps it all. So, yeah. yeah. So I'm going to change subjects on you here in okay. a minute. Go for it. The whole aging world interest in longevity. And I was talking to you about this a little bit before is, you know, the fact that you got interested in this 
and switched gears at a young age. The majority of people in this space who are interested in this are late 30s, 40s, yeah. and 50s, and yeah. such. But here you are in early 20s, and it's like, hey, aging is pretty cool. I'm going to get into that. What flipped a switch? What What's the deal yeah. there? Because well, in my early 20s, I was not thinking along <laughs> that, those lines. Yeah, well, so I hate to disappoint you, but but I, I, I might have looked like I was in my early 20s. I was actually, how old was I when I went to graduate school? So I started graduate school in... 1998, I think okay. 1997, no, That's 1998, right. one of those two. Yeah, yeah. I'm old, I can't remember. But I was yeah. born in 1971, so I was in my late 20s when yeah. I started graduate school. Um, but I mean, I think the reason why I got interested in aging, it was a total accident. So I, um, so in my, tw in my early 20s, I was, I, we should, we should, we'll have, we'll, we'll talk about this over beers. I suspect I was way worse than you were. Certainly in high school, I can almost guarantee I was worse than you were. Um, but that's a different story. Uh, but I got interested in aging. I went to, I went to graduate school. So I got my undergraduate degree at a college, not far from here, about 90 miles North of Seattle called Western Washington university. It's a, you know, sort of smaller state school. I loved it. Absolutely love Western. Um, probably would have be living in Bellingham, the city that Western's in now, if they had a world-class research in institution there. Cause it's just love the city, love the university. Um, but like I said, it was a smaller state school uh, where I feel like I got a really good education, but they didn't really have graduate students. They didn't really, you know, it was, it was an undergrad experience. Mm. Um, and so I didn't even really know what graduate school was all about. Mm. I just kind of knew I liked science. I wanted to keep studying and, and, I, and I enjoyed my undergraduate research experience there. Mm. And so I... Um, I got accepted to a bunch of places, but I ended up going to the biology program at MIT. God, you want to talk about culture shock? Go from, go from a little state, you know, school, Western Washington University, to a high-powered MIT, and oh my God, that, was, that that that's another different story. But um, but I survived my first year at MIT, and uh, and I went there thinking I was going to study biochemistry uh, or. Uh, biophysical chemistry, x-ray crystallography, something like that, protein structure, because that's what I was trained in. My undergraduate degrees were in biochemistry and mathematics. I had two, two bachelors. Um, but I heard a talk during my first, it was between the first and second semesters at MIT by Lenny Garenti, who I ended up doing my PhD with, where he, he gave a seminar about how his lab had started, you know, using genetics and molecular biology to study aging. Mm -hmm. And it was just something about the way he presented it uh, and the idea that we could actually study something as complicated as aging using these tools, right? Biochemistry, molecular biology, genetics, just stuck with me. And so I went and I talked to Lenny and ended up joining his lab and did my PhD working on the genetics of longevity and have stayed in the field since then. And I think, you know, again, at first I was enticed by the complexity of the problem. Like I recognized immediately this is really complicated. And that, that appealed to me. And then I also recognized very, very quickly how important it was. I mean, I, I've said this before, but I absolutely believe that if your goal, and this is supposed to be the goal of NIH research and biomedical research, if your goal is to improve human health, mm -hmm. there really is no biological problem more important than the biology of aging to improve human health. Every major cause of death and disability in every developed nation has age as its greatest risk factor. If you want to have an impact on human health, modifying the biology of aging is the way to go. And so I, I recognize that early on. So I think those two things were what got me interested in the field. And then obviously, as I've gone through my career, you know, my specific interests have changed as we went down the different twists and turns that you do in research. And also, as I've gotten older, right, it becomes a little bit more, more personal. But mm -hmm. um, but that's how I got into the field. And, and, uh, and I think, you know, one of the things that I've seen that is um, encouraging to me is, you know, when I started in the field, there were very, very few graduate students who went to graduate school to study aging. You know, they didn't, most people went to graduate school thinking they were going to do cancer biology or heart disease or neuroscience, right? right. Very, very few people went specifically with the intention of studying aging. That's changed. You actually now see quite a few graduate students as undergraduates um, identifying longevity, aging as an area of science that they want to specialize in and intentionally choosing graduate programs 
that have good research in that area. And so I think that's been a paradigm shift a little bit in, in the field as it start, started to become more mainstream. Yeah, that's, yeah, whenever I went to the AGE conference last summer, yeah. that's one of the things that was uh, kind of striking as a lot of these guys are, you know, their 20s and yeah. just hearing what they were working on. And, you know, one guy was working on an immunization for, you know, senescent cells. And yeah. I never thought cool. about that, but <laughs> it's like, yeah, these brilliant young yeah. people just going. I, I say this all the time and I, and, I, I, and I totally, totally believe it, which is why I keep saying it, which is that one of the things that I, that makes me most enthusiastic about this field is just how many just amazingly smart and put together young people are coming into the field. And, and we were talking about, we compare our sort of high school selves, right? Uh, compared to where I was at that age, mm -hmm. these, these kids, and again, to me, they're kids. I know they're not really mm -hmm. kids, they're adults, but, uh, they are just so far ahead of where I was that it gives me a lot of optimism for yeah. the future. Yeah. yeah, agreed. So now we just need to see that shift happen in the medical field, right? So again, I think this is the this is a question that I often you know think about is um, what needs to happen for MDs to start to recognize the that there is a different way. And again, I'm totally generalizing. So if I'm offending any MDs, I apologize. But I think, I think as a as a rule, right, medical training is still very much disease focused and reactive, right? And so what has to happen for this sort of paradigm shift, you know, what Peter Atia would call the shift from medicine 2.0 to medicine 3.0, what needs to happen for that to become the dominant paradigm? in medical training and we're a long ways away from that i think i'd love to i'd love to believe that that's going to accelerate and happen quickly it's very hard to imagine that happening quickly in the current healthcare structure yeah yeah agreed it's that's such a traditional thing that's been going on so long then and, and as you know that you know the medical community just takes a long time to switch uh i think it's I'm optimistic. I think it's coming because like we talked about young people being interested in that field. I've had young people come to me and, you know, who are medical students or, you know, interested in what they're going to go into and they want to hang out with me and see what we're doing. Yeah. So there's some interest in that. And part of that has to do with just the information out there. Yeah. Um, so I think it's, I think it's going to go at a snail's pace though. Yeah. Well, hopefully things like what we're doing right now, yeah. you know, like you said, the information out there, I think if you get credible voices out there talking about this, mm -hmm. that people can relate to, hopefully that can have an impact. So mm -hmm. I think, you know, that, that, that definitely, um, is important and, and, and hopefully this can contribute a little bit, um, to that. I think, you know, still one of the things that's missing, we don't have, as far as I know, a continuing medical education course in longevity medicine or health span medicine, or, you know, so I think those kinds of things could also play a role in if it can be done in a very rigorous way in giving medical professionals the tools that they need mm -hmm. to, to feel confident in adopting this sort of a, a, a approach to health. Yeah, yeah. Expanding the education. Uh, and no medical schools teach no. this kind of stuff yet. I think that'll change. I think we'll start to see the first early adopters in medical schools with, I don't know if it'll be a longevity medicine or health span medicine or, you know, something, mm. uh, start to bring that into the curriculum. So that would be something that, I mean, there's no reason it, it should have happened already, but um, hopefully we'll see that happen. Yeah, it's not in the curriculum. <laughs> All right. Well, any of you medical uh, deans who are out there listening. <laughs> okay, yeah. cool. Anything else you want to talk about? We've covered uh, a lot no. of stuff. No, it's good. Awesome. All right. Well, thanks for dropping yeah. by uh, Optispan HQ today. And Seattle was just right, right, yeah, right where I was going. Yeah, it's uh, it's kind of gray outside, so we'll, yeah. we'll have to get you some vitamin D. Yeah, <laughs> actually, it's funny I did forget that. So, yeah. all right. Well, we'll get cool. you taken care of. All right. Thanks, man. Thanks.